Where you know it? It's still setting up. I think it is live on YouTube. I do this every single time. It's probably live already, but I want to just wait to make sure I see the thing. All righty. <laughs> Welcome to BIMS Dives. I'm Dr. Tiara Moore, founder and CEO of Black and Marine Science. And today we're diving into funding ocean research with Dr. Brandon Jones. The conversation will be moderated by our Chief Relations Officer, Chris Howard, and our Chief Management Officer, Alex Troutman. Dr. Jones is the Program Director for Education and Broadening Participation Efforts in the National Science Foundation's Directorate for Geosciences. At NSF, he oversees programs that focuses on undergraduate and graduate workforce preparation for the geosciences and supports initiatives related to increasing diversity and enhancing inclusion and belonging in STEM. And we are so excited to dive into funding ocean research now. He's going to tell us what, where the money resides, y'all, <laughs> to get our research done and a little bit more about his background. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will answer those towards the end. All right, Alex, I'll hand it to you. Thanks. All right, Dr. Jones, it's good to have you. For the first question, as a program director at the National Science Foundation, what does funding ocean research mean to you? Yeah, well, first let me say thank you for the invitation and um, it's an honor to be here and you know, hello to everyone out there and, and uh, those that are joining. So funding ocean research, I mean, you, we can think about the traditional federal funding models for any kind of uh, research discipline in any, any kind of research activities. And of course we do that here at the National Science Foundation in, in the Directorate for Geosciences. But from my perspective, uh, I'm thinking about how science is conducted, which means uh, the methodologies and the, the ways of knowing. So outside of the traditional European model of conducting research that's only about 500 years old. What about the 5,000 year old ways of knowing from native and indigenous scholars or the 10,000 uh, year old ways of knowing from uh, West African communities who've been monitoring natural and uh, physical phenomena for millennia? You know, so, so why aren't those ways of knowing part of our research enterprise? And when it comes to ocean uh, science, uh, I'm looking at, and, and really any of the disciplines in the geosciences, I'm focused on how, who, who's conducting the science, because as I've said, you know, in, in a few other presentations, science doesn't conduct itself. Humans conduct science. So we're not doing our due diligence as scientists if we're only allowing a unidirectional approach to, uh, to, to the research. And so the funding is beyond just money for me. It's, it's the support of the human power behind the research. Uh, yes, great, uh, great answer to that question there. Uh, so like Alex had uh, mentioned earlier, that you are the program director for NSF. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about your background and how it led you to that position you're in today? Yeah, so uh, I'm originally from Southwestern Ohio, uh, so not much ocean going on over there. But when I was growing up, I had um, dreams of oceanography, I don't know, early on. Uh, just just thought about the ocean, always uh, thought it was fascinating, et cetera. So there were two uh, signals that I received that kind of pushed me along my way in uh, fulfilling that dream of being a, a marine scientist. One was internal, which was my family, uh, and mainly my grandparents who took me fishing all around Ohio and, and places like that. And so I used to always think about the, the fish and other organisms I would catch or find in streams and lakes. And I would wonder, wow, I wonder what's in the ocean. If I'm finding this kind of life in these small bodies of water, which I thought were really big at the time, um, but I knew the ocean was just vast. 
And so I, you know, I, I wondered about that. The external signal came from a show, I wondered about that. The external signal, Jacques, well, Jacques Cousteau was the scuba diver who had a show that used to come on uh, the National Geographic Channel way back then. Um, and he uh, took a camera crew with him and his scuba team all around the world. And they would do these scuba diving expeditions I'm um, in these exotic locations and, you know, they would, the, the different kinds of fish and the corals and all the different types of crustaceans and, and life and everything. Uh, so that really was a link to uh, the potential or possibility for me that that put the vision out there for me. Like, okay, that's what it looks like. That's what it is. Um, and I, I've had this experience with these bodies of water so now I, I gotta I gotta do what I need to do to 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 make it to the to the ocean, and so I did that after I finished high school. Went to uh, undergrad at an HBCU, um, the Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Uh, no geoscience programs there at the time. I was a biology honor student, so I was put into the pre med track, you know. And that that's one of the issues we got to really uh, look at with our HBCUs is. Um, what kind of earth system science programming exists outside of say ag, or in some cases um, like at Hampton or Savannah State, there's some ocean programs or at Tennessee State or Jackson State, there's an atmospheric program, um, A&T as well. But we're talking, that's leaving out, you know, 85, 90 of the other institutions. Um, so at Howard as well a big atmospheric program at Howard. But anyway, um, I was fortunate to have an advisor at Lincoln who was a marine scientist. And so that's how I got my experience with doing some research for him and with him. And um, from there, went to graduate school at Delaware. And um, I, I will say, I, the first time I was at Delaware, I got my master's degree and I realized that I didn't, I wasn't ready to move on to a PhD. Um, even though I liked science, it just wasn't ready for that, that full on academic experience. Um, and so I ended up teaching high school for five years in Maryland. And after teaching high school, I went back to Delaware, more mature, a little older, ready, and uh, finished my PhD. And after that, I ended up uh, doing a one year, you could call it a policy postdoc at the EPA in DC, Environmental Protection Agency. And I ended up getting hired there after one year. And I was there for about 13 years. And then I came over to the NSF. There was a position that was open um, in uh, spring 2016 for um, the education, broad and participation program director that worked in the front office of the director for geosciences with blah, blah, blah. And um, that's how I ended up at NSF. And that's where I am now. So that's the, the short story. Thank you for that. Um, I grew up fishing with my family also. Um, that's how I also found the, my love for the ocean. And I was also kind of privileged um, that my dad was a seafood manager um, for a local store. So I got to experience all the different sea organisms that he brought home. Um, so that helps me um, to look into marine science for uh, myself. Now on to the next question. Um, what advice can you give students who are applying for grants to conduct their research? Um, myself as a student learned that this process can be hard, especially if you um, don't have a background in it or don't have any um, one to guide you. So what advice could you give to um, the future scientists that are applying to these programs? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, for most federal program, federal science programs and grants, the the uh, the official uh, mainstream grant mechanism is for uh, professors. You know, individuals who that doesn't mean they have to have a PhD, although that's most of the time in academia. But it it means um, individuals who have a certain position at a university. And, and so oftentimes, well, at least for NSF, we leave 
the qualifications of a PI up to the institution to determine. So NSF doesn't say that, for instance, a graduate student cannot be a PI. We don't say that. But the institution is pretty much not is going to say that a grad student doesn't have the qualifications to be a PI. That's for the main grants, right? Uh, but there are individual funding streams. Uh, many of you are familiar with fellowship programs and many agencies, certainly at NSF, there's the GRFP, Graduate uh, Research Fellowship Program. But through other organizations, depending on the, the funding stream, uh, museums or aquaria or learning centers or, or other not-for-profit organizations uh, can also be eligible to apply for grants. And if they have depending on what they um, are proposing as far as research or as far as education and training, um, a graduate student or even an undergraduate student could be written into those grants to uh, receive support, not only to conduct research, but also to fulfill some kind of mission for that organization, that aquarium or that museum or learning center or, or what have you. And so there were there could be some potential for some, some great synergies and network networking opportunities for the student. So um, one thing is to, to just open your mind as to what you want to do and not think that um, that there's only one or two ways to receive support to do that. So the best thing to do is when you have a an idea or dream is and is is to reach out to a program director, or reach out through the networks, and it's much easier now uh, than it was just say ten years ago because we have organizations like BIMS, you have LinkedIn, you have all these other um, I would say identity professional societies like. Uh, let's say SACNIS or National Association of Black Geoscientists. So you have all of these existing networks now where all you have to do is send an email or send a tweet or um, post something in LinkedIn or any other uh, social media platform, and you're going to get some hits and you're going to get some ideas um, about maybe I need to reach out to a learning center in my community and talk with them about uh, submitting a grant and I could be written into the grant. Or maybe I do want to just apply for a fellowship. You know, that's that traditional model. Um, or maybe I uh, want to figure out how I could get connected to um, a department or some research going on at another institution, maybe not your home institution, and then talk with your advisor about how to collaborate with the people that are at the other institution that are doing research because you have ideas too. So we, you know, you don't have to just go along with um, what your professor or your advisor um, is doing, depending on where you are in your, in your academic career. So that, you know, the options are open. Um, so don't, don't close yourself in, don't wall yourself in, just um, start asking questions, start putting your ideas out there. Um, and so you could get some some feedback and, and start moving forward with a plan. Thanks for that. And what you said at the end is definitely important. Moving forward with the plan, you don't want to have applied for some grants. Most like we definitely don't want to go in there without having your your ducks in a row. And that's for sure. Exactly. And uh, <clears throat> on to the next question. Um, so like you're saying, there's many different options out there for grants of you know varying. Uh, competitiveness. Um, so are you aware of any grants or uh, funding specifically for Black or people, of, scientists that are people of color? Yeah, that, that's a good question. In the federal government, <clears throat> there, are, there are laws that, uh, aside from, um, say, individual programs or individual um, fellowships like GRP. There are laws against, or I won't say against, but laws that inhibit uh, targeting individuals uh, for outreach for specific programs. Because most federal funding, um, is, especially through the funding agencies, goes to institutions. It doesn't go to individuals. 
So inherently, you can't really target uh, a group of individuals. You can target, uh, depending on how the agencies read policies, you can target certain institution types where there happens to be high populations of scholars of color. So that you could do that because NSF has an HSI program, an HBCU program, um, a tribal college undergraduate program. So we, we have two-year college programs. We have specific programs just for those institutions and um, you know, with the recognition that many of those institutions have high populations of students and faculty of color um, that, that could take advantage of, of those opportunities. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's on the federal side. Now, specific individuals, I mean, uh, private corporations can do what they want. Um, philanthropic organizations can do what they want. Nonprofit organizations like professional societies, if they give grants or support or something like that, they can do what they want. They're not inhibited by law um, like the federal government is because we're funded by taxpayer dollars. So that, that's the main reason we can't just target individuals. Um, so if you look at the example a few weeks ago of, and this has nothing to do with research, but it's wild. Um, you know, it's just a wild example of where we are today. Jeff Bezos gives all this money to Van Jones and says, I'm giving him, I don't know how many, it was millions of dollars or something. And he could do what he wants with it. Yeah, at least that's what was reported in the news as to the mm-hmm. quote. So, you know, a, a, a billionaire can do that. Um, and through his philanthropic organization, they could do what they want. So it, it might be worth um, even, you know, figuring out how to expand your networks into that realm um, also, it's, it's again, it's wide open. Yeah, and to kind of uh, a follow up on that uh, last question there mm-hmm. is, um, so what are some ways that, like the awareness for some of these grants and funding programs for underrepresented scientists, like how can, do you have any advice for uh, young scientists going out to try to find some of these uh, opportunities? Yeah. Um, I'd probably give the the same advice that I would give to uh, folks in many of these universities that have said over the years uh, that that they just can't find students of color. So I'm I'm gonna get the same advice to to you all as I would say to them, stop fishing in the same pond. I mean, if you, you keep going to the same places you can't come back to me and say, well, I can't find any. You, you know, did you do your due diligence as a scientist and explore all options? Then, you know, I'm not trying to hear it. So that's the same, same kind of advice. And, you know, what Alex and I were just talking about with the fishing and our experiences growing up with um, learning about the different organisms from, in Alex's case, it was seafood. In my case, it was freshwater. Um, but you fish in a stream, you're gonna find something different than in a pond, there's something different than in a lake, there's something different in Lake Erie um, as, a, as one of the Great Lakes. So I would say, uh, don't, again, back to, don't limit yourself to just looking for federal funding, uh, but again, utilize, leverage your networks, uh, social media platforms, and do some research on on, on the potential or the possibility for all different types of support. And one thing you could think about, well, and people have been doing this, this isn't new, people have been doing this for some time is cobbling together different streams of funding um, to, to support you in what you're doing. You may have, may have one stream that's the major one, but then you have these others that are gonna help you with travel uh, uh, to conferences. And maybe you have another one that helps you with um, I don't know, depending on where you, where you are in your academic training, uh, fees or, you know, equipment. You know, if you're doing, uh, well, with ocean science, it's a little different. But if, uh, you know, you have colleagues who are doing solid earth science, they need equipment to go out in the field. So, I mean, you need equipment to, to do ocean research as well on vessels and lots of times uh, expensive. 
equipment. Um, so yeah, I, just, I would just suggest be innovative, leverage your networks. And, and, and if you have a crazy idea about, I wonder if such and such, if so-and-so would give me money <laughs> to do whatever. Hey, I mean, what, what's what you're going to hurt or, or how's it going to hurt just to ask you never know especially at this time in human history where a lot of organizations they, they may have set aside uh, funding and they just don't really know what to do with it or how to how to disseminate it um, to divvy it up and, and so they may need a, a young bright person like um, uh, like you all or or, or someone to give them that option. So, yeah, I always say the worst, the worst thing someone can do is say no. So, might, might as well, might as well. All right, we have a question from the audience. Um, what systematic or systematic barriers have you seen directly relating to funding and smaller bipod led organizations? And what has you, what have you or NFL done to combat these challenges? Yes. So what, what systemic barrier have I directly seen? And, and you say I'm relating to funding of. Funding of smaller BIPOP led organizations. Okay. Um, I would say in the, the federal world that I live in and work in that, for instance, review panels could be an issue. Um, so when proposals come in, you know, who from the community, what experts from the community are the ones responsible for, for rating reviewing and providing common input to these proposals. So that, that could be, a, and if you have a program director who um, really relies heavily, even though the decision is on NSF and we do take all reviews um, from the community, we incorporate those into our decision, but reviewers don't make decisions for us. But there are certain cases where um, the expertise in the community is, is such that we do rely heavily on that expertise. But anyway, um, you know, review panels can ha have some power uh, there and you have to be intentional as a program director. And this is a way to correct that is to have uh, diverse panels you know, have individuals on your panels from all different walks and backgrounds, certainly still having the expertise to uh, apply to an appropriate and critical review of the proposal, but bringing along a perspective that gets back to my, my initial comments about incorporating other ways of knowing or thinking about implications of this research or how this research will be sustained, or will the participants in the research receive the support they need, all those kinds of things, which are just as important as what's the research plan and what will be the intellectual merit of the research. So review panels is certainly one that I've seen can be key um, in, in, you know, in that funding process or that, that uh, recommendation process for funding. On the publication side of things, I would say editors and editorial boards at, at, um, at um, publishing houses or in certain journals um, and things of that nature for books and articles and publications. You know, who's, who are the editors? And, and what are they saying about the article that's being written, uh, the research that's being conducted? I have heard and I've seen um, editors push back on native and indigenous scientists who did wonderful research, high, high caliber research, but because they were incorporating uh, traditional ecological knowledge, the editor was like, this isn't real science. 
so then they don't get published. So then that in the traditional model of tenure and promotion in the academy, publications are one of those main currencies. So you have an editor that's not going to let you get published, you know, so you see what happens, right? Um, so we have to, because it's systemic to your point, Alex, we don't have the luxury of just one approach to fix this. It's got to be all throughout the entire system, not just the professors and advisors and deans and chairs um, and review panels, but editors, um, individuals who are program directors, uh, those individuals that come, for instance, to NSF from universities as rotators. And, and those are professors or researchers or scientists that come to NSF and serve as program directors for one or two or three years. Um, and that's important because they're the program directors at NSF have the most power. You heard it here from me. We have a lot of power. Uh, we get to create the review panels. We get to write the solicitations. We, we get to decide where the funding goes. We, uh, of all the positions at NSF, program directors have a lot of power. And if you have rotators that are coming in from institutions that aren't diverse, or those rotators haven't had experiences with um, scholars of color or, or even thinking about other ways of approaching science, or I won't say other ways, but multiple ways of approaching science and they're trained in the traditional, then you're gonna get the traditional products out of them. Um, and, and so there are lots of places where we could start to pull on, on levers in the system to, to get the change we need. That's that's just great. Uh, we have another question from the chat that I think relates pretty well to that last question. Um, and you want you know our listeners here to be able to be successful as possible for uh, funding projects. And they asked, so what uh, would make a successful proposal for funding to sort of try to get past some of those barriers? What? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That. So. Um, Things to pay attention to in a, in a proposal. Well, first off, I would say anything that you write, an application for a fellowship, an application for a job, a proposal for a grant, whatever, always, yes, you do your due diligence, you do your research, you write it up, proofread, et cetera, and you have lots of tools online now that, that help you with the burn structure and all those kinds of things. But you always want to have some folks that are in your circle uh, read it before you submit. Um, and you want to have multiple people read it. You want, you want your cir circle to serve as a critical uh, review panel or an editorial board um, because that safe space and the safe input it is a better place to receive uh, the, the, the criticism um, or the input than to just put it out there uh, for the world to chew it up. And so uh, that's the first thing I would say, you, you, you make sure you wanna do that. When you're applying, when you're submitting a proposal or applying for a fellowship or something like that, you wanna make sure that you are paying attention to the details in the description, um, in the solicitation uh, for NSF, every proposal that comes in, doesn't matter what kind it is, has to meet at a minimum, the two criteria of intellectual merit, what, what's the science, what's the research, how is it innovative, how is it transformative, and broader impacts. How is this related to societal benefit? How will it um, meet the needs of, of individuals who are being impacted by the research or who are conducting the research, et cetera? Those are equal criterion. And, and so you got to pay attention to those. The other thing you have to pay attention to are what we call so solicitation specific criteria. So each program may have other areas that they want you to address in the proposal. And you want to make sure you address them because the reviewers are going to be looking for those elements and the program is going to be looking for those elements. Um, and so you want to make sure you're as thorough as possible in addressing 
everything that's in the solicitation that that is stated um, to be addressed. Now, um, you're, yes, you have leeway um, in many programs. They won't be prescriptive in how you address issues, but you just need to address it in some way. Sometimes they, they are, they want you to have uh, certain sections in your proposal and thing. That's another thing you wanna pay attention to if there are specific instructions on formatting. Um, I've seen proposals, and, um, not in my program, but in other programs in NSF that the idea and the intellectual merit was awesome, broader impacts, but they're formatting and they didn't pay attention to uh, putting these sections here and this section there and, and, and headlining. And so the proposal got returned without review. Um, so, I mean, the, you may say, well, what's that got to do with, um, you know, with the science? And, and that's a fair question. That's a fair statement. But on the other side, you have to recognize that at a federal agency, especially like NSL, that gets a lot of money and we receive hundreds of thousands of proposals throughout the, the foundation. Um, it is, it's overwhelming at times to be able to give each proposal its due diligence, even though we have systems in place to do that. And part of the systems we have in place say, you got to meet these requirements, even if they, they sound pretty strict, um, because you, not just because we have a large volume, but also that's a signal to us that is that person or is that PI team going to pay attention to the details in their research if they're not paying attention to the details in their proposal and what we're asking? So that's a signal. You know, we're looking at the, the, whole, the whole package. Um, so there, yeah, there's a whole lot I could say about that, but those are just a couple of things that come to mind um, about you know pay attention to details when you're submitting proposals. And let me add this, and ask questions. You you for NSF you can ask questions. Um, I know that's something, and I've heard it over and over again, not just from students of color, faculty of color. I've heard it from um, white students, white faculty. They Somehow, in a lot of institutions, it's ingrained in them that you don't you know, don't reach out to NSF, don't talk to the program directors. You just do the best you can and submit. Um, and I'll tell you, the the big research intensive institutions, they send emails all the time um, when, when they're thinking about an idea or they're thinking about submitting a proposal, and that and that's what we want. So I'm encouraging everyone that's listening to this. It's okay to ask questions and get clarity and, and even, you don't wanna overload program directors with a bunch of questions and a bunch of emails and a whole bunch of write-ups, but think through exactly what you, what you need and, and reach out to them. Thank you for that. Um, I would say for me, um, applying for or submitting a proposal um, it's similar to applying for a job. You got to be very detail oriented. Um, you want to list the skills, uh, what the job is asking for, and just like you want to list what the proposal um, is asking for. Um, so I kind of that's the way that I kind of looked at my proposal um, as I was applying for funding was like I was applying to the job. Like you don't want to limit yourself by not listing any skills that they ask for, and you know you have them. Um, so that's kind of what I got um, from my proposal um, applying experience. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, for me, like I've been working um, in the um, employment field as a marine scientist for several years now. And throughout my experience, many times I have been um, one of few people of colors or many times the only person of color. Uh, would you say that uh, career opportunities in the to the ocean science are increasing or decreasing? And do you think the funding plays a role in that increase or the decrease? Yeah, uh, I don't. 
So according to the projections, and I'm thinking mainly of the recent reports of uh, geo, geoscience workforce projections, and geoscience is uh, defined as any of those earth system sciences, which includes oceanography and, and related uh, marine sciences. For the last, I'd say handful, if not more years, um, there's a necessity for more trained earth system scientists than are being trained. So just overall, we're not generating the number of trained geoscientists to fit the needs of uh, the, the geoscience workforce that's out there. And when I say trained, I'm not just talking about you have a graduate degree, master's or PhD. Uh, we're talking from associate's degree to bachelor's degree or, or, or what have you, some kind of, because the types of job, and this gets to your question uh, more directly, Alex, the types of jobs in ocean sciences um, are broad, okay? So it's not just I need a PhD because I want to conduct research. I want to do research on whales, you know, that's, that's the, or dolphins, you know, or seals or something. Um, there are, or even if you get down to biological oceanography, chemical, physical, you know, marine geology, geophysics, what have you. Uh, we need ocean engineers, and you don't need a PhD to be a certified engineer, you know, or, or licensed engineer, I should say. Um, you get that with a master's degree. With the number of, um, what do they call them? I don't want to say unmanned, and that's, that's not the correct term anymore. But with the number of uh, remotely operated you know, vehicles in the water now, uh, drones, not not just air, but also ocean going. Um, you need engineers, you need computer scientists, uh, you need data scientists, uh, you, you need electricians, um, you need mathematicians for the, the, you know, the guidance systems, GPS, et cetera. So yes, yeah, some of that, maybe you need a PhD, but you could also work for a company that's developing uh, these and apply a bachelor's or master's level set of skills for that. Uh, we need people in policy. Um, and you don't need to, you could watch any C-SPAN video of Congress and you will quickly see that you don't need a PhD to be in Congress. I'm not gonna get real political right now, but you could tell by what goes on, that's not, that's not fair, but there aren't a lot of PhDs in Congress. And we're talking over, uh, you know, what, 540 something, or whatever the number is, 100 senators and 500 and something, um, or 400 and something reps or whatever. Um, you know, not many of them have PhDs. As a matter of fact, the majority don't. Uh, there's only a few medical doctors, okay? so. We need people with the training and the skill set in all different sectors. And so when you're thinking of, oh, you can work at um, Ocean Conservancy, all kinds of positions there. You could work at other um, um, you know, organizations like not-for-profit organizations that have a focus on, on the ocean. You could work at the Pew Charitable Trust. And you can you could work at a federal agency and be a um, you know, a program analyst, uh, you know, depending on what agency it is that, that has um, ocean programs, opportunities at, at NOAA, et cetera. So anyway, um, again, don't pigeonhole yourself into thinking or to even allow someone to push you or make you feel guilty that you need to keep going in this specific track and through academia to get a master's or get a PhD, you know, it's this PhD thing. Because honestly, um, the higher you go in, in any organization, the less flexibility you have. So if you, if you move up into management, middle management, you don't have as much flexibility up there because you're closest to the top and you have to tow the company line or the federal line or the agency line 
or the institutions line or whatever. Um, and you know, if you find an area, and it all depends on what you want to do as an individual. And if you find an area where you can utilize your gifts and talents that intersect with your skills and you're passionate about it, and it relates to the ocean, you know, I think the opportunities are out there. Got to do a lot of looking. We have to do, we on the ocean side and the professionals who happen to be in these positions, we have to do a better job about um, showcasing what opportunities are out there. Because, you know, we see it and it's easier for us to say, here are the opportunities versus someone who's trying to get in doing a bunch of research and not really spinning their wheels and getting frustrated. So we had to, we got to do a way better job. And that's one of the issues with geosciences and I'll close with this um, earth system science careers. One of the main issues is there isn't a direct link to careers from geoscience disciplines. Um, we went through the K through 12 system, chemistry, physics, and biology. That was the main science. That's just about the main science for anybody that comes through the systems in the US and the education systems. Well, physics and chemistry, you automatically, it's engineering, automatically, biology and chemistry, it's medical, it's health. You, you see electricians, um, you know, you, you see the direct connections and they're there, even through the media. Uh, but when you talk about earth system science, what do you do? Uh, what, what can I do? How can I? So we got to do a better job of making those connections um, so that there's a demand uh, for people to want to have that content and learn about it. And I completely agree. There's definitely a disconnect between the positions that are out there and then what's known like to the general public. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad to hear you say, just mention some of those positions as you were talking, because that's something we always say and like to hear our guests reiterate that, you know, you can be involved in marine science and not even, you know, touch the field at all. You know, you can be from your desk and be a marine scientist working, like I said, on math, some of those unmanned systems. So it's always great when we hear our guests, you know, reiterate that point that you don't have to go get all dirty and play in the muck to be. Right. Like Sarah. <laughs> Stay out of mud, here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think this is our last question we have for you tonight. It's, uh, so you've had a successful career and uh, had some great achievements. And uh, we just like to hear about some of those highlights of your career so far. And then what advice do you give early career professionals? Um, yeah, that, that's, I don't usually, as they, I guess they say, blow your horn, tweet your horn or whatever. Um, I think in the last four or five years, I've received a lot of offers and invitations to be involved in, in leadership at different organizations and for uh, at different levels. And I think that in and of itself lets me know that, so I'm doing good work, it's impactful because people recognize it, uh, but then my name is out there and, and which is why these invitations for these, these positions are coming and I'm turning them down because like I just said, I feel like I would lose flexibility and, and really not end up in a place where I would be happy doing what I'm doing, et cetera. So, you know, I've had invitation from a, you know, a major university to be a dean. I was like, nah, but I, I count that as a, that's, that's pretty good. Um, a, a major organization that, uh, has political influence in the science realm um, uh, and, and does a lot of interfacing with Congress and, and such, uh, reached out to me about a leadership position some months ago. I was like, eh, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, and so um, it, it, that, I think that recognition is, it kind of makes me feel good, but at the same time, um, I'm wondering, well, who are they going to get for those positions? I know there's a lot of folks out there that, that are way more qualified than I am. So um, hopefully the selection and search processes work out 
I think my time on my recent time on some uh, board of directors for organizations has really been great for me professionally. Um, and I'll I'll mention two of those leadership positions, and then I'll mention one within the federal government, and I'll be done. Um, so I, I did a four-year stint as a board of director for AGU, American Geophysical Union. And so I was, you know, at, interfacing with the CEO, the, the presidents of AGU, because they were board members. Um, and I got to set, you know, be a part of the discussions to set um, the vision for AGU and make decisions about uh, programming and financial aspects for AGU and work with the very talented staff at that organization to implement the programs, all those kinds of things. I've never been a part of a, a board for an organization that large. Um, and so I learned a great deal professionally from that. I, I really enjoyed that. I was also, and I still am, this is my last year, simultaneously a board member for the Environmental Leadership Program, which is a small not-for-profit organization, although it's growing. Um, so I got to, I was much more hands-on in a lot of the details of the organization, um, at that, that small organization. So I got to see that, how a small organization operates and how a larger one operates, both at the leadership level. Great opportunities to help steer those organizations, but also learn for myself. So those are the two uh, highlights. On that side, the, the highlight from the federal government, as I mentioned, I was at the EPA and for about two and a half years under the Obama administration, I was the EPA representative for the federal STEM strategic plan overhaul process, I'll call it that. And so I represented the entire agency along with individuals on this group um, Leland Melvin was from NASA. He was the education director over there at that time. Um, and other individuals from all the science agencies. And I was part of that process to develop a new STEM strategic plan for the entire federal government under uh, the Obama administration. It was like a five-year plan. So that was a remarkable experience to work across all the agencies and see how that process works, working with the White House, uh, the meeting at the White House, we're really at um, the Eisenhower Building, which is part of the White House complex. Um, you know, all of that kind of uh, internal policy discussion, deliberation, negotiation, slugging it out kind of thing, that was, that was fascinating to be a part of. So I think that was a highlight of my career um, also, so. You know, I know you say you don't like tooting your own horn, but I think it's always nice to be your your own biggest fan sometimes, you know? I, I appreciate Paul. that, Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you are right. You are right. So, um, uh, is there any advice you'd like to give, you know, young career professionals? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I've been kind of giving it as I've yeah, that's true. going through. Um, you know, I, I, I think everyone is taking... Uh, some certain things to heart now uh, and, and for, I would say, certainly since last year with all that was going on last year um, with the social unrest that, that we're still pushing for um, and, and the justice uh, just all across uh, every sector, uh, racial injustice and, and fighting for that and, and gender equality and uh, equity, et cetera. Um, you know, simultaneous with the pandemic that has dipped, but now coming back up because I guess, I don't know, selfishness and people also probably, the majority of the people in the country, I don't know, maybe they got D's in high school biology and don't understand how viruses actual, actually work, but, um, and they don't know what a vaccine is. It's not a cure. I, I had to stand on my soapbox and say that right now. But anyway, um, so I'm saying all that to set up this statement, uh, take care of yourselves. You know, uh, we certainly have seen Again, the polarization uh, beyond, behind uh, the greatest gymnast in the world ever, Simone Biles and her decision a few days ago. So we see uh, an entire group saying, yes, mental health, 
take care of your mental health, take care of yourself. The system is not going to do it. The system will continue to use you if you don't stand up and do. And, and Naomi did the same thing in the French Open. And we could argue that Shikari Richardson in another way was taking care of herself because of the, the news that she received in such a, the horrible news in such a horrible way, you know? So, um, so take care of yourselves, take care of yourselves. Um, you know, you, you need a circle, you need people in your corner, you need cohorts, you need friends, you need um, a community that allows you to have a space to scream, holler, cuss, bust, vent, throw ideas around, you know, just relax, just be yourself. Uh, you, we, you need that. You need that. And so be intentional about taking care of yourselves. But at the same time, um, be intentional about your time management. Be intentional about your physical health, not just your mental. Um, and, you know, be intentional about what it is you want. And as we were saying earlier, Chris, to have a plan about that. And, you know, it may take an hour or two or maybe half a day to just sit down and, and bang out that plan. But when you do that, uh, it's going to pay off and, and over the long run. And you're actually, you'll see immediate payoff. Um, you know, within weeks of just taking that set amount of time and just get it out there. Um, so, you know, that's just some advice. And it's, I, I am excited about the early career professionals that are out there now. You, you all um, and others who are in all in the sciences and all across because you all are, in my opinion, are the first generation that are coming into yourselves with your eyes open to the system. I would say my generation, and I hate to do the categories, but it, it helps in the description. So my, I'm in Generation X, they would say that. So I'm not a baby boomer, nowhere near that. Uh, but I'm not a millennial, nowhere near that. You know, we're, Generation X is a whole nother thing. And we didn't really, I would say, and generally speaking, didn't have our eyes open to the system until maybe in our late 20s, 30s, and we're like, oh, okay. But I'm seeing the millennials and generations after. You all are, you're aware, my daughter's 13, and some of the things she says and, and does and the comments she makes, I'm like, wow. Like she's she's there already, um, and I got to catch up to her, you know. And I'm I'm not 13, so uh, I know what I was doing when I was 13, and I was not thinking like her and her friends. So um, I am excited about what that means for the future, because you're just not going to the early career professionals. Y'all just not going for whatever. You're just not going to do it. And, and you will let it be known. No, we're not doing that. And there's enough of us, there's enough of you, there's a critical mass now to all of you say no. Then the system is like, oh, we weren't prepared for all of them to say no. So I guess we better, we're going to have to make some adjustments. So that's what I'm excited to see. Um, so keep, keep pushing keep pushing. Individuals like myself and others uh, who are in our positions right now, I see this as, um, and I, my good friend Catalina Martinez at, at NOAA and uh, Latisse Lafere at, at NOAA who I went to grad school with and some others. Um, we know our job is now just to keep the doors open. That's our job. We had individuals that came before us, like, like an Ambrose Gerald or someone who had to push and kick and fight to get the door open. And then that let me come in or an Ashanti Johnson or a Deidre Gibson at Hampton and come in, hold the door open. And now you all can just come in and um, do what you need to do. So I'm, I'm excited to see what the future holds. Yeah, thank you for that. That was definitely ending on a, on a high note. There, some, with some great advice. 
Um, and I think we have some, uh, we put on our social media today to um, ask, we asked, uh, what are some projects, you know, if you'd like to see funded, uh, marine science project like to be, be funded. So just gonna read some of those responses out. Okay. Uh, do you have some of those up to you, Alex? Yes, so the first one is they would like to see impacts so of climate change on sea scout fishery uh, funded. And that was by Dacker 105. And then Jackie V said she would like to see community resilience projects prepare for a sea level rise, hot water intrusion, and rewilding coastal land. Um, that's a good one because we know that many of the low lying areas around the um, coastal US are in those um, low economic status areas. Um, so we definitely need to be um, pursuing and pushing for to stay in front of sea level rise for that. And then one last one is improve airline search for sharp products and better labeling. What's the improve? Uh, improved aerial searches for search aerial. products and then uh, better labeling. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, so we definitely had some good uh, responses from some of our social media followers there about uh, some product uh, projects they thought would see funded. Yeah, that is cool. Good thinking out there. <laughs> Well, this has been so awesome. We actually have a couple of extra minutes, three minutes left. I'm very punctual. But if you don't mind, I have a question. Okay. Um, so we were talking about, you were talking about um, proposals and basically two things being really important, the intellectual merit and broader impacts and broader participation. And that is where I would really love to hear from you what the intention behind that section actually is. And I'm kind of being facetious, but I'm bringing that the perspective of, in my experience, people, I'll just give a real example. Someone will contact folks at the very end of like them writing a grant, say, oh, it's Friday. And then, oh, hey, we're just now working on the broader impact section and it's due on Monday. Can y'all help us because you're black? <laughs> you know, like, so like, I know that's really not the intention that NSF had when they, when they made that. So I would really like to just clarify and how we, how we can prevent this and really say, hey, this, you should think about it the weekend before, you know, more than a weekend before. Right. Uh, yeah, that's real talk. Um, I would encourage you to say no. And uh, this also gets back to one of my answers about, um, the importance of program directors at NSF and the review panels that they they put together, uh, because the review panels are going to make comments about uh, the intellectual merit and broader impacts. And if you have a review panel that's all of one mindset, and it's not really uh, a mindset that's keyed in on the broader impacts part, then you know you're going to get all kinds of fluffy stuff that comes through. And, and may end up being supported that's not doing anyone any good. And really, um, that, that, like you said, Tiara, that's not the intent at all of what NSF uh, provided. So I would, or uh, provided within that, um, within that criterion of, of broader impacts. So like I mentioned earlier, intellectual merit and broader impacts are equal value, equal weight. And I would say just to the science community, uh, whatever energy you put into intellectual merit, you need to put that into broader impacts. Meaning, if you are a larval ecologist and you need to know where the water goes because your larvae are planktonic, then you go look for a physical oceanographer. That's, that's a no-brainer. Everybody does that. But when it comes to uh, outreach and diversity, the larval ecologist thinks they can do it themselves. No, you need to go find an educational researcher or a social scientist, or so you need to go find the expertise for broader impacts, just like you found it for intellectual merit. And so I would say position yourselves, early career scientists of color, in this instance, uh, black marine scientists, position yourselves so that you're in these discussions as they begin. So when you're going to the poster sessions at meetings, um, don't just go to the just don't just go to 
you know, ASLO or the Fisheries Society or SURF, they go to the larger meetings too, because there's the, the types of funding that's coming out is convergent funding, very interdisciplinary. And those big conversations oftentimes happen at those big meetings. And with a well-designed poster or talk, you can be that connector that people will then want to have when they're formulating an idea and you won't be the last minute call on a Friday. You'll be, you'll be part of it from the beginning. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I mean, we are here because of you and we're just so um, honored that you have done the work that you have done. Um, thanks so much to everyone listening. Um, definitely tune in to our next um, BIMS Bites episode next week. 